hope you came ready to sing this morning. And maybe you got about two people's reaction down the front. Are you ready to sing this morning? Did you bring your faith? Did you bring your joy? Come on. There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As He walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear praises He Jesus, for all you've done, all you're doing, God. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. 
Jesus, we sing your praise, lift your name. Oh. Come on, why do you step out? Lift your voice. Come on, when he moves. Jesus 
sleeps. Is that right? Is it 24 or 23? I'm going with 24. It gives us one more sleep to get ready. Hey, my name's Sam. I'm one of the pastors here. And so a huge big welcome to everyone that's joined us here and joined us through the screens. You know, I was thinking about this morning and um, I was thinking about if this was a religion, if Christianity was a religion, then you would spell Christianity this way. Do, D-O, it's all about what we do. Have we done enough? Have you done enough this morning to get God on your side? Have we done enough this morning so that when we pray, God will hear us? And that's what religion is. It's all about what we have to do. But Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is spelled done, D-O-N-E. It's not about have we been good enough? It's what Jesus has done to make us right with God. It's what Jesus has done that gives us the confidence to know there is an open heaven over your life, that you can pray with confidence and you can know with confidence that God is for you. That's why the Bible says we enter His gates with thanksgiving. And I love the message, it just says, thank you, thank you. And that's our stance this morning. And I pray that's your stance. We simply say thank you to Jesus for everything He's done. And so will you pray with me? Will you believe God with me? We've got a whole lot of prayer requests. People believe in God for all sorts of miracles and breakthroughs. On our trees, you've been faithfully putting up people's names that you're believing that this Christmas, that they're gonna come to know Christ. And someone here is Howard and Gary and Michael and Jamal. And and I know for me, I've got I've got names on all the trees and all the on the different things but you know I know also in your heart there are people that you know you know there wouldn't be a greater thing this Christmas than to know that they're taking another step closer to Jesus and that's exactly what we're going to believe for so can you reach out your hands can you pray father we want to say thank you thank you for Jesus thank you for the confidence that we have and Lord you see every need that's in my hand that's in the hands of Father, in our other locations. And we pray and we believe You that You will bring the breakthrough. Lord, that You will bring the turnaround. And for Lord, those that are in our heart right now that are away from You, we ask You and we thank You that in Jesus' Name, 
Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your conviction. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your kindness. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of your Word. Lord, that you will have the last say in their lives. In Jesus' Name. So come on, one more time. Thank you for the open heaven over every person's life. I thank you this morning for your presence. It's so evident. And the Father, that you will, you will have the last say in each person's life. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Who loves a good praise report? Good praise report. Someone here praising God for His kindness and favour over their daughter. And uh, those of us that have daughters would say, Amen. I love this one. Thanking God for his wife and his daughter getting engaged. How awesome is that? In the 8 a.m. service, we had, uh, this was the praise report from Greg and Sue. Thanking God that our last child has been married. And uh, last child was all in capitals. And uh, who knows, that's like a pay rise. That's like freedom now to do whatever you want, you know. And anyone else got a last child they're waiting for to be married? Yeah, Paul, Paul. Hey, that's a couple of weeks now, Paul Douglas. One week away. You look so happy. It's, uh... <laughs> oh, there he is, Tyler, Tyler. Can you believe your dad is, he's, he's cheering that it's only one week away before you get married. So tell us, mate, any, um... Can you fill us in? Where are you going on your honeymoon? Like, uh, could we could we join? Are you going to do Instagram? Is there? A... Um, we're going to go suffer in Hawaii for a couple of weeks Hawaii, over right. Christmas. That's okay. So please pray for us. We'll It'll definitely be, be praying for you, mate. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I don't believe that for one minute. That is going to Hawaii. Hey, yo, say hi to someone. Why don't you grab a seat? Hey, look, if, um, if maybe it's the first time that you're joining us here or maybe one of our other locations. Hillsong, so you know, Hillsong's not a crowd. We're actually a family. And we would love to do nothing more than help you get connected. So please, at the end of our service, we have a welcome lounge just around the, out there and around the corner. And we'd love to host you to get to know you better. And I know in other locations, we do the same. So make sure you don't rush off. We'd love to connect you and help you become part of the family. Hey, right now we're gonna receive our giving and we have our very own and very awesome and grandmother of Lola Monday Toglavalu. Yes. It's their first service in church first over service. there. Why don't you so. stand up, guys? Yes. Let us see the baby. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Amen. I know we need someone. Peter, do that sort of Lion King thing. <laughs> Can you do it, Peter? <laughs> need, need David Ware in the room to do the... Can you all do the Lion King thing? Where is he? <coughs> Hurry, mate. 
quick, run. You got, you got to do the Lion King thing. And Pete's going to hold the baby. Laura's going to hold the baby up. No, she's... I feel like a frog. Peter, hold the baby up. Hold, hold her neck. Hold her neck. <laughs> hold the head, Pete. Ready? Ready? Do it. No! Brilliant. That's all I know. That's all you had? And I apologise if I offended anyone. Yeah, and... Excellent. I may have got you to do that at colour once when we had another baby here. Good morning. You came to church for that, didn't you? Amen. You're looking beautiful this morning. How good are you? Amen. Did anyone wake up tired this morning? A little bit tired. Be honest, be honest. A little bit tired this morning. It's the end of the week. Come on. Anyone tired this morning? There we go. Honesty. But do you feel better now that you've been in the house of God? Without doubt. Without doubt, Brian sends us love. He was on his way home, but he needed to attend to something else. And so this morning, he's actually um, chosen to go and preach for the very first time or speak for the first time in Hillsong, Dallas. So I hope you know that's a brand new room for us happening in Dallas, Central USA. And um, he's gonna have fun there, amen? All right, my joy this morning to speak to us about our giving and around our giving. And uh, so you can begin to prepare. There's obviously various ways. If you're new or visiting, there's, you're under no compulsion. You're our guest this morning, but you can also contribute. And there's various ways that we at Hillsong Church understanding the power and the dynamic of kingdom finance and what the Bible says about um, godly finance and what um, the Word says about our first fruit. Bringing our first fruit to the Lord is quite a profound thing. It's an eternal principle. Literally, as we honour God with our first, then His blessing actually remains on what is in our hand. His blessing remains on what remains. And He just tends to bless that and cause it to prosper and honour it. So He's pretty amazing, right? Amen. So there are the various ways. But personally, I think that nothing speaks louder, more profound, more clearly, more precisely to what we're doing than the Word of God. So I'm simply, as you prepare, I'm simply going to read to you um, from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, if I may. In the Amplified, it's magnificent. And it says, verse 6, Now remember this, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows generously, that blessings may come to others, will also reap generously and be blessed. Verse 7, Let each one give thoughtfully, and with purpose, just as He has decided in His heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver and delights in the one whose heart is in His gift. Verse eight, and God, who? God, and God is able to make all grace, every favour and earthly blessing come in abundance to you so that you may always, under all circumstances, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient in Him and have an abundance for every good work and act of charity. Verse nine, as it is written and forever remains written, He, the benevolent and generous person, scatters abroad. He gives to the poor. His deeds of justice and goodness and kindness and benevolence will go on and endure forever. Verse 10, and again, God who provides seed for the sower and bread for eating will provide and multiply your resources for sowing and increase the fruit of your righteousness, which manifests itself in active goodness, kindness and charity. Thus, You will be enriched in all things and in every way so that you may be generous and your generosity as it it is administered by us, the body of Christ, the church, will bring forth thanksgiving to God. (laughs) That's a big passage of Scripture to read. But nevertheless, if you allowed it to, to sink into your spirit, to absorb into your spirit and become the, um, the mark of your life, it will be true in your world. Do I have any people in the room or watching with us through the screens who would agree? Is that true? Amen. Why don't you hold your gift in your hand and I'm gonna pray for it, hallelujah. You're a faithful and an honourable and a wonderful church and you enable a vision to happen, amen. You enable a vision to happen. You enable us to like throw wide the doors at Christmas and invite the community in and they come, they come easily. They feel safe to come in here 
and we bless their families and we spoil their families because You enable this house, this storehouse, to be beautiful for them and to the glory of God, amen. You got your gift in your hand? Father, we just thank You for Your kindness and Your grace. And Lord Jesus, I pray that these verses, this truth will be our portion. So Lord, bless bless every home and every household. And as we honour You, Father God, my prayer, our prayer, is that Your blessing will reside on what remains, Father God, in Jesus' Name. Amen. Amen. I love you, church. You're the best. Our hosts are serving us as they always do. I have graduated onto the app. Can you believe that? I came, I know I'm so 21st century now. Yes, but um, it's my joy to do that. All right, they're serving us and we're gonna look to the screen and we have another beautiful story in context of Kilo of Christmas. Amen. Fantastic. My dad was in jail when I was born, so I grew up with just mum and Growing up in Housing Commission, there was a lot of alcoholism and violence and that really affects the community and families. I remember, um, oh geez, I would have been four or five. I had the salvos rock up one day and gave us a push bike and I thought it was like the greatest thing in the world, you know. I actually felt free. I didn't feel like I was locked in a home. I could just sort of open up and be myself. Christmas is a really stressful time of the year for lots of families. And we actually find um, in domestic violence refugees that we work with that they say that more women and children access those services at that time of year than any other time of the year. What I love about this campaign is that it's our church giving what they can. And every single person can get involved, no matter how small or how big your donation is, you actually can make a difference. Tora and Lisa lean into our Christmas campaign so much because they actually understand the power of a gift. So I remember uh, our first ever year of the Christmas Appeal and Tor coming across the car park with these bikes and scooters and he was just so excited and I just thought, wow, that's his little sign that I'm going to make some little fella's Christmas amazing. To us it might seem like a really small item, but that item that that person receives could really touch their heart and know that somebody is there for them. It's pinnacle moments like that when somebody's there and they do something for you that you don't expect. It makes you want to be a different person. You know, we all go through things and it's only that one little thing that could get you through that specific time you're in. Tor and Lisa's story is a great example of the power of giving back and the power of a gift that makes a difference. And that's why we give at Christmas. That's why as a church we give. It's why as a church we honour Jesus at this time by giving to those who are in vulnerable situations. What a fantastic story, hey? And uh, that's what Kilo of Christmas is all about. You know, for us, we get this great opportunity uh, to give. And uh, many of you have taken these bags and you fill them in. Others, uh, a lot of our church has got online and, and uh, contributed to uh, the Keel of Christmas online. And if you do it online, that's all tax deductible as well. So we're really needing these to come in uh, over you know, this tonight and next weekend so then we can have the biggest wrap and pack party here and get everything ready uh, to give out, which would be absolutely awesome. And um, I'm just thinking, what's happening tonight, Serge? Any, uh, any idea? The whole building is going to be lit up tonight. Can you believe it? The launch of Christmas. The launch of Christmas. And uh, you know, I've been watching um, and uh, right across this whole property as it's, be- as it's been unfolding. And we've got a whole lot of new areas and new things for tonight. And uh, we've got rides, we've got heaps of awesome food. All the kids are gonna get something really special as a gift, but it's gotta be dark for them to fully enjoy it. And, uh, and also we're gonna be attempting something that's never ever been attempted. I think in all of, not just our church, but the, right across the whole of, of the Hills area. And so you don't wanna miss it. And we're really hoping and praying that it's going to work. Okay, so this is edge of the seat stuff, guys, but it will be amazing. So that's tonight. Don't miss it. Make sure you bring, bring, bring your family, bring your friends. We're going to have an incredible light launch as we always do with a whole new dimension. All I'm saying is you may need a jacket. That's all I'm saying. It's going to be brilliant. Hey, check out the screens and check out what's next. 
2019 will be a year of breakthrough, favor, and blessing. I believe revival is in the air. Yet again, we can set some miracles in motion. These are the days of God's gathering. I'm going to tell you, Christmas at Hillsong, you don't want to miss it. Hey, can we all stand to our feet everywhere where we're joined as well? And I'll tell you why we do this week in, week out. It's not for the exercise. We do it because you know what? We want to honour God's Word. We believe that through the preaching of the Word that this morning, God, one Word from God could absolutely change everything forever. And we want to honour God's Word for that. And secondly, hey, there's no better way than which we can really thank and give a huge warm welcome to Scott Sanger Samways as he comes and brings the word this morning. Yes. How's everyone going this morning? Anywhere you like's fine. That's yeah, that's a good spot. Are you ready for the word this morning? So nice to see you in our 9 a.m. service. All right, come on, let's pray. Father, we just thank you. God, for the opportunity we have, keep coming around Your Word. Father, And we just pray that once again, Your Word would speak to us. Father, Your Word would bring truth, would bring hope, would bring life to people's situations. Where areas are needed, Father, let the Word bring breakthroughs. And Father, we thank You for the power of Your Word. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen. Well, you like the person you're sitting next to? Good. It's too late now. (laughs) All right, you can be seated. You can be seated. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right, if you got your Bibles, we're going to turn to Isaiah 43 and verse 18. If you don't have your Bibles, it's okay. You can read along on the screens. It says, forget the former things. Somebody say the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Someone say the past. Anyone guilty of that? Dwelling on the past from time to time? Easy to say, harder to do. Forget former things. Do not dwell on the past. The title of my message this morning is Outlast Your Past. Outlast Your Past. You know, wolves hunt in packs. In fact, wolves, they're raised in packs. And in every wolf pack, there's a dominant wolf, which is called the alpha wolf. And the alpha wolf has the power over the pack. The alpha wolf is the one that controls the pack. It's domineering across the pack. But every now and then in a pack, a wolf breaks free. And when a wolf breaks free from the pack, that wolf's called the lone wolf. And the lone wolf, breaks free from the pack because it wants to start a new pack. But while the wolf is in the pack, 
it can seem impossible to break free because of the power of the pack. But you see, as soon as he does, when a wolf breaks free from the pack, it realises that the pack no longer has power over him. And here's the reason why. Because when one wolf breaks free from a pack, they say the pack weakens. And in some cases, a pack can completely break down where wolves go their separate ways and it doesn't remain a pack anymore. Well, I say all that to say this, that your past can feel like a pack. It can feel like something that can seem impossible to break free from. But when you do break free from it, you will see that it actually doesn't have the power that you thought it did. And so that's what I wanna talk about this morning is how you and I can outlast your past. You know, your past holds emotions and feelings. It holds victories and it holds failures. It holds joys, sorrows, happiness, hardship. But all of us at one point or one time will have to face our past. And a decision has to be made Am I gonna keep struggling with my past, returning to my past, or am I gonna make a decision to outlast my past? See, your past might represent an old habit, might be a pattern of thinking, might be a way of behaviour, a relationship, a personal flaw, maybe, your, maybe an addiction, an unstable mental state, maybe a dependency or a weakness, a failure, a place, a hurt, a tragedy or a loss. And wouldn't it be great if we could just delete our past? You know, like an email, just gone. You know, just, just hit the delete button and it's gone. Wouldn't it be great if you could erase your past? Just some of it, you know, keep the good parts, but just erase the ones you wanna forget, you wanna deal with, you just erase your past. You know, when Keddy and I, you know, when we first got married in that first year of marriage, I remember, yeah, there's lots of romance in marriage, you know, in the, the first year. And, and I wanted to do something romantic. And I thought, I want to take her out to a real fancy restaurant, you know. And so I'd booked this place in Sydney, in Darling Harbour, and I thought we're going to take her out for a bit of a romantic night, you know, and to a fancy restaurant. I knew it was a fancy restaurant because the plates were larger and the meals were smaller. <laughs> so I knew it was fancy, you see. And so we go out to this restaurant and we're having a great romantic time and we're, we're looking into each other's eyes and there's sparkles in one another's eyes and we're enjoying the meal. She ordered the chicken, I ordered the steak and potatoes. And as we're enjoying the meal on this romantic night, the, the conversation took a turn. And the conversation went from being nice and romantic to what I call in our marriage, well, not an argument, but an inconvenient discussion. Anyone here, you've ever had an inconvenient discussion? <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And so this, could, you know, this discussion, it just kept sort of escalating and we were going each other and it was just, you know, becoming, I mean, she went from eating that chicken to just stabbing that chicken, you know? I mean, I was looking into those eyes with a sparkle. Now I was looking into the eye of Mordor, you know? I was, I was like, there was fire in her eyes, you know? And, and so it started to escalate and, you know, I mean, we were just going each other like a pit bull on a poodle. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was, there was, it was just at each other. And so then, so then I thought, we've got to get out of the restaurant, you know, we've got to get out of this environment. Let's change, go to a different place, change, you know. And so we went across to, on the other side of the harbour, there was some swings near Luna Park. And so she got on the swing and I started pushing her and we started having conversation, but that inconvenient discussion just wouldn't go away. And I was pushing her, all right? I was gonna push her right in, you know? I mean, I was pushing her. And, 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 and so, you know, we got off the swings and, and then we, I said, right, let's do something. We'll go for a walk on the harbour, up the water. You know, so we, we started out hand in hand walking up the water, but pretty soon the hands got ripped and there was about three metres apart from us when we got to the end. And I mean, she was giving me the silent treatment and I was giving her the growling treatment. And it was just, you know, it just didn't end well. And you've got to understand at that stage in our marriage, we were so young in our Bible reading, we weren't up to the part where it said, don't let the sun go down on your anger. No, we were still in Exodus where it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I mean, we were going one another. You see, it was just all happening. You know, I heard, I heard once person say, you know, when you get married, you marry the ideal. But then it, 
you discover the real deal, which becomes an ordeal. You've been think you got a raw deal and then you want a new deal. <laughs> but we, well, true story, we woke up the next morning and I was like, I just want to erase the whole of last night, you know. And you know, and that's the thing is, you can't erase your memories, but you can replace your memories. You see, when you start to live out the Word of God and it starts to affect your choices, it starts to affect your language, it starts to affect your thinking, you begin to recreate new memories and replace new memories through what God begins to do in you. And so true story, the next morning, I woke up and I said, Keddy, I said, we can't erase last night, but we can replace it. I said, we're going out to dinner again. She looked at me with horror in her eyes, like, please, no. I said, no, we're going out again tonight. We're doing a date. And so true story, we went out the very next night. We went to the exact same restaurant. She ordered the chicken. I ordered the steak and the potatoes. But that night, those potatoes, they were sweet potatoes. Because something began to change in the atmosphere, you see. And and so we were, that sparkle was back and we were looking into each other's eyes. Then we went over to the park where the swings were. Same set of swings. She got on the swings. I started pushing her. But as I was pushing her, I started reciting poetry to her. Well, that's how I remember it anyway. And, and, and so I was pushing her. Then we got off the swings and we go for a walk down the harbour. We start walking in the harbour. We're slow walking, you know. And, and before you know, we had a little French kiss by the water. I wanna tell you, the whole night was a different night. You can't erase your memories, but you can replace them. But here's the thing when it comes to your past is you never just face it as a once off, do you? Sometimes when your past comes up, it can be something that's reoccurring. It can be something that you continually live with, something that continually comes up every now and then. And you know, it might be something that you struggle with, something that you fought with, something that you lived with, but the reality is you want it to remain in your past. And there's things that I find will trigger your past. There's things that trigger memories. I mean, you can go through life and you're thinking everything's good, but then you can hear a song and that song can trigger a memory that takes you back. You can see a photo or a picture and it, and, it, and it triggers a memory that takes you back. You can run into someone and have a conversation or see someone and, and th that relationship takes you back. And here's the thing, when it takes you back, it often takes you back to an emotion or an experience or a feeling, a desire or a thought. But you can't change your past, but you can learn from it. And you see, even Jesus had to face His past and make the decision to outlast it. Have a look with me in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power, someone say the power, in the power of the Spirit. And news about Him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised Him. He went to Nazareth where He had been brought up. Someone say brought up. It was where He was brought up. And on the Sabbath day, He went into the synagogue as was custom and He stood up and read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to Him and unrolling it, He found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Go down to verse 22. All spoke well of Him. And we're amazed at His gracious words that come from His lips. And then they said, isn't this Joseph's son? They asked, isn't this just Joseph's son? Go down to verse 24. Jesus said, truly I tell you, He continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Go down to verse 28. All of the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, they drove Him out of the town. They took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Nazareth was Jesus' past. Nazareth was where Jesus was brought up. 
Nazareth was where Jesus lived. Nazareth was where Jesus was known. Nazareth was where Jesus' boyhood years and teenage years were developed. Nazareth is where the community knew Jesus. The families knew Jesus. His neighbourhood knew Jesus. Nazareth was Jesus' past. But even Jesus had to make the decision, I'm gonna outlast my past. And you and I can do exactly the same. And I think it comes down to a couple of things that we learn from Jesus. Comes down to what I believe, comes down to what I say, comes down to what I see and comes down to what I do. So let's have a look at the first one, what I believe, which is the power of the Spirit. In verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Too many people don't think change is possible because of the power of their past. I was talking to a man just this week and because of destructive behavioural patterns in his life that had been done for so many years, he honestly didn't think that change was possible for him. And that's what sometimes the past can seem like, that the power of the past seems too impossible to break, too strong. Well, you don't know what I did, Sanger. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what happened to me. You don't know what people did to me. You don't know the mistakes I've made. You don't know the failures I've been through. And the power of the past can seem so strong that on the inside, people live with a turmoil. That on the inside, people live with heartache. That on the inside, people live with a bitterness and an unforgiveness and a hurt and a rejection and a loneliness. And on the inside, there can be like a restlessness that just continues on the inside. Oh, you wouldn't know it from the outside, but on the inside, it's the restlessness from the past. People live with it. I remember watching Dr. Phil. Anyone here you've ever seen Dr. Phil? On TV, Dr. Phil. Oh, he loves a bit of good advice, Dr. Phil. And so I was watching Dr. Phil a couple of years back and I remember watching this episode and Dr. Phil was talking about how you can achieve inner peace how to live with inner peace in your life. And what Dr. Phil said, the way that you're gonna achieve inner peace is for you to go back and finish all the things that you have started. And he talked about all the things that you've started in life. If you would go back and finish them, then you will live with inner peace. So I remember getting up that morning and before going to work, I went down to the fridge and I finished off last night's pizza. I finished off the cheesecake. I finished off the milk as well. Then I went and finished a Netflix series. And I gotta tell you that morning, I felt pretty good. I felt like I had inner peace. But here's the thing is a lot of people don't. A lot of people still live with an inner restlessness from stuff from their past. But can I tell you this morning that the power of the Spirit is stronger than the power of your past. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what it was. The power of God and the power of His Spirit is stronger than the power of your past. You see, whatever you're facing, whatever is reoccurring, you've got to understand what was inside Jesus was greater than what was behind Jesus. He'd been with the Father. He'd been with the Spirit. And you've got to remember when moments start returning to you from your past, you've got to remind yourself, I'm not the person that I once was. I'm not who I used to be. No, I have the power of God in my life. I have the Word of God and I have the Spirit of God. I'm not who I used to be. Because the power of the Spirit is stronger than the power of the past. I've seen the power of the Spirit do wonderful works in human lives. People, drug addicts become clean, alcoholics being made sober, dependencies broken, unforgiveness set free, broken marriages restored, financial hardship recovered, prodigals returning, families reunited, down and outers finding dignity, failing friendships mended, hurts and tragedies turned into joys and hopes, not because of finishing something that you started, but because of the power of the Spirit of God that brings change into people's lives. You see, the Holy Spirit, knowing the Holy Spirit, knowing about the Spirit is just information. But the power of the Spirit is transformation that happens in people's lives. So it comes down to what I believe, the power of the Spirit. Here's the second thing we learn from Jesus is what I say. 
which is declaring your future. What I say, you wanna outlast your past. Verse 16 says, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. I love that Jesus makes the greatest public declaration of who He truly is in the place of His past. He goes into His past and He declares, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Oh, what a declaration. You can see the newspapers of Nazareth today, homegrown boy claims to be Messiah. Oh, what a controversy that would have stirred in the community. But you see, Jesus knew who He was. He knew where He was going and He wasn't afraid to declare who He was in the face of His past. Sometimes you've got to do that when your past starts reoccurring, when that past stuff starts rearing its head. You've got to speak out loud the power of your confession. You've got to say out loud, no, I know who I am and where I'm going. I know who I am in Jesus Christ and I am who He says I am. You see, your past does not rule your identity. Your past is not who you are. Note this in in the Scripture, the verse, verse 17, it says the scroll of Isaiah was being handed to Jesus and He read from the scroll. In other words, Jesus got His identity from the Word of God. He didn't get His identity from His past. And you and I have to do the same. You can't get your identity from what was done to you, from what someone did to you, from what happened to you, what failure you made, what mistake you were a part of. No, your identity is in Jesus Christ and what He says about you. That's who you are in Christ. You're a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. All things have become new. And in the synagogue custom, when the reading of the Word would happen, it meant that people had to stand. So Bible history, whenever there was the reading of the Word, people would stand to read the Word. When there was the teaching of the Word, people would sit. But at the reading of the Word, people would stand. And you know, sometimes when it comes to your past, you're gonna have to take a stand. And it means standing with the Word of God. It means standing against that old habit, that old behaviour, that old dependency, that old relationship, that old thinking, that old attitude. And you're declaring, I'm not living like that anymore. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not trying that anymore. And I'm not saying that anymore. This is who I am in Jesus Christ. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm the light of the world. I'm the salt of the earth. Oh, you gotta start to declare who you are in the face of your past. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. You know, the last Roman gladiator match was held in January 1st, 404 AD, where a Colosseum in Rome was filled with 80,000 screaming Romans as gladiators were fighting one another in the arena. There was blood, there was shedding of lives, there was killing. And in the midst of that arena that day, there was a monk by the name of St. Telemascus. And St. Telemascus, he went in the middle of the arena, he starts shouting, enough, forbear, forbear in Latin, but he's saying, enough, enough, holding the Word of God. And the crowd started to shun him and quiet him and try and silence him, but he kept shouting, enough, enough. And he made his way down to where the gladiators were and he, and he yelled, and enough, enough. And he kept shouting, forbear, forbear, enough. But the crowd started to turn on him. And as he got over and got closer to the gladiators where the match was and the fighting was, the crowd turned on him. And all you could see was him holding the Bible saying, enough, enough. And the crowd stoned him to death in the middle of the Colosseum. And that was the very last Roman gladiator match that was ever recorded in Roman history. After that, the game ceased. When it comes to your past, sometimes it means you've got to take a stand. Sometimes it means you've got to go, you know what? Enough, enough. I'm not going there anymore. I'm not doing it, enough. Sometimes it means you've got to take a stand against what's coming against you from your past 
and say enough. So here's the next one. It's what I believe. It's what I say. And here's the next one, what I see, which is living in freedom. You see, in verse 22, listen to what the past said about Jesus. They said, isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. They only saw Jesus as Joseph's son. Too many people will do the same to you. They'll only see you through the eyes of the past. They'll only see you by who you were, what you were like, what you did. They'll only see you through eyes of the past. The people of Nazareth saw Jesus the same way. They had grace standing before them. They had mercy in the flesh. They had the promise of God right in the midst of them. They had the Son of God, full of the Holy Spirit, but all they could see was, isn't this Joseph's boy? You see, human nature does this all the time. We paint a mental picture of someone, but in our minds, we never allow that picture to change. Oh, once a liar, always a liar. Once a cheat, always a cheat. Once a gossip, always a gossip. Once a bully, always a bully. Once a gambler, always a gambler. Once an addict, always an addict. Once an idiot, always an idiot. It's like we paint this mental picture of people. But can I say that when you begin to talk like that, when you begin to see people like that, that is the biggest lie that the enemy wants you to believe. Because what you've got to understand, you've got to go from a still mental picture of someone to a moving motion movie about someone because their story is not over yet. Your story is not over yet. How the movie starts is not how the movie ends. So God's not done with you when it comes to you living in freedom. So don't let others hold you to your past. You see, your past will try and hold you in a prison. You see, the Bible says in verse 28 and 29, let me summarise, it says they were furious. Then it goes on in verse 29, it says they took him to the brow of the hill. Other versions say that they thrusted him in their hands. Other versions say that they were filled with rage with him. In other words, they treated Jesus like a prisoner of his past. They treated him like a prisoner. But here's the thing. Don't let someone else hold the keys to your future. Don't let someone else hold the keys to your future. Jesus didn't let the people from His past hold Him to His past. Hold Him from His future. Your past will either prison you or it will propel you, but it's up to you when it comes to your past. You hold the keys to your future. In fact, Jesus in Matthew 16, verse 19, Jesus gave the kingdom of, uh, the keys of the kingdom of heaven to Peter. Why? Because Peter had a revelation of Jesus. When Peter got this revelation of Jesus, he was given the keys. So it was up to Peter to unlock his future. It was up to Peter to unlock his potential. He'd been given the keys. Don't give your keys to someone else. Don't let them hold the keys to your future. You hold the keys to unlocking what God is doing in you and through you and before you when it comes to what He has for your life. You see, Peter was Simon the fisherman. But now with a revelation of Jesus, he began to unlock his future as the rock, as the apostle, as the man of God, as the preacher in the early church. You see, you hold the keys to your future. You hold the keys to living in freedom. Jesus said in verse 18, He has come to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. I love that statement that says every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. You can either live in the prison of your past or you can let your past propel you into your future. But it's up to you what you see when it comes to living in freedom for your life. You hold the keys. So it's what I believe, the power of the Spirit. It's what I say, which is declaring your future. It's what I see, which is living in freedom. And then here's the fourth one, what I do, which is overcome daily. I wanna outlast my past. Well, it comes down to what I do, 
which is overcome daily. Verse 29 says, they took Him to the hill in order to throw Him off the cliff. Jesus didn't let His past kill Him. His past tried to throw Him off a cliff. That's what your past will do if you let it. It'll try and kill you. It'll kill your God-given potential. It'll kill your God-given dreams. It'll kill your God-given desires. It'll kill your God-given calling. That's what your past will do if you let it. But you have to make a decision to overcome daily things that come your way from your past. And you're not doing it by willpower. You're doing it by spirit power. Because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. You gotta realise you're not alone. You're not, by, you're not doing it by your strength. No, you got supernatural power, holy strength from heaven when it comes to overcoming daily. You know, there's a jellyfish in the Greek islands and this particular jellyfish, it only eats a certain type of snail. But here's the thing, when the jellyfish starts to eat the snail, it takes a long time for it to digest the snail that it's eating. But as the jellyfish is digesting the snail, the snail begins to eat away at the jellyfish from the inside out and most times kills the jellyfish. The very thing the jellyfish was swallowing was the very thing that was killing it. You know, that's what your past is like if you let it. You keep allowing your past to come in. You keep swallowing that lie from your past that you have to stay in it, that you have to be held to it, that you have to live. You keep swallowing it. It'll kill your God-given potential. It'll kill that God-given calling. It'll kill, it'll kill whatever God has begun in your life. It'll try and kill what God has started. That's what your past will do. But notice something about Jesus. Jesus didn't stay there. Jesus, He didn't stay in Nazareth. He didn't stay in His past. And you're not meant to either. Don't stay there. You're not meant to keep hanging around that place, that habit, that behaviour, that struggle, that dependency, that feeling. Don't stay there. Don't put yourself in a place where you think, now I've got to just stay. This is who I am. No, it's not. Jesus went to His past, but He also went through His past. You're meant to do the same thing. The Bible says in verse 30, but He walked right through the crowd and went on His way. Did you know when it comes to your past, there's some things you're meant to walk through. Sometimes you'll have to walk through some past regrets, some past hurts. You'll have to walk through some past losses. You'll have to walk through some past conversations, some past offences, some past relationships, unresolved issues. But God doesn't intend on keeping you there. He doesn't want you to stay there. Jesus walked through the crowd and went on His way. Some of you have stayed in things that you were meant to walk through. You've stayed in hurt. You've stayed in offence. You've stayed in tragedy. You've stayed in grief. You've strayed in revenge. You've stayed in hatred. You've stayed in things that you're actually meant to walk through. Don't camp there. Don't stay there. You know, Queen Victoria, she was married to King Albert in England, one of the most uh, famous kings and queens of England. But tragically, King Albert died before his time at age 41. And history records that the Queen never recovered from losing Albert. Her love for him was so strong that every day she had the servants lay out new clothes on his bed because in her heart she wanted to believe that he was still alive. And for the next 20 years, every day until her death, she wore black in mourning for Albert. In London, wherever you go, there's so many buildings that are named after King Albert, so many buildings named after Queen Victoria. And the story is told about this romantic love that never before has a love so strong been seen from a, from a queen to her king. And they tell it like it's this beautiful romantic story. And yes, it's a romantic love that sounds so good. But when I heard that, I thought, yeah, it's romantic, but it's also so sad. Because I thought no one is meant to live in grief for that long. No one's meant to live in loss for that long. No one's meant to live in heartache, in pain, in depression for that long. You see, here's the thing is... 
It's time to get up. It's time to go through. Don't stay in it any longer. I remember praying for a lady in church and I said, what can I pray about for you? And she said, well, I need you to pray for grief. And I said, what's happened? Did someone die? She said, yes, my mum. I said, when did your mum die? She said, 20 years ago. And I thought no one's meant to live in that sort of grief. But sometimes we camp in things. Sometimes we get stuck in things. Sometimes seasons last longer than they should and we find ourselves staying in things rather than walking through things. But can I remind you what Jesus did in verse 30, but He walked right through the crowd and went on His way. Went on His way. Maybe today the Holy Spirit is speaking to some people and saying it's time to be went on your way. Don't stay there any longer. Hurt, I'm leaving you because I'm on my way. Guilt, shame, I'm leaving you because I'm on my way. Grief, I'm leaving you because I'm on my way. Bitterness, offence, I'm leaving you because I'm on my way. Failure and mistakes, I'm leaving you because I'm on my way. Unforgiveness, regrets, I'm leaving you because I'm on my way. Past, it's time, I'm leaving you because I'm on my way. Come on, someone, it is time to outlast your past. Jesus faced His past and He overcame it. So let me ask you this. What is it that you need to overcome today that's something from your past? Is it something you're holding on to? Something you're returning to? Something you're always reminded of? Something that rules you? But maybe today, the day is the Holy Spirit saying, come on, it's time to overcome. You need to learn to overcome daily. You need to learn to overcome daily. See, if you don't let your past die, it won't let you live. Who here, you wanna make a decision today to outlast your past, come on. You wanna make a decision saying, yeah, I'm gonna outlast my past. Why don't you stand to your feet right now? When I say outlast your past, I'm saying, you know what? I don't wanna return to it. I don't wanna cave into it. I'm sick of struggling with it and I don't wanna live with it. But today you're saying, I wanna outlast it. I'm gonna overcome it in Jesus' Name. So can we take a moment right now as the team lead us in worship and let's think about what the Holy Spirit is saying to you personally right now. Come on, is there something that you need to deal with? that you need to let go. Come on, if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, why you lift your hands? Something from your past that you wanna outlast. Something you're saying, yep, man, it's time. 
Maybe the Holy Spirit is saying, come on, stop talking like that. It's time to start to change your confession. Stop believing like that. Come on, the power of the Spirit is greater. Come on, you can overcome this daily. Because what God can do in a moment can bring transformation. So Father, right now, we just pray for every single person that's got their hand raised. You know what their past represents. You know what their past is full of. But Father, I thank You for the power of the Spirit of God. I thank You that today is a new day. I thank You that today we're choosing to declare our future. Today we're choosing to live in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Today, Lord God, the power of the Spirit is at work. And God, I thank You that today represents chains being broken. Today represents once I was broken, but now, God, what You're doing in our lives. So Lord, we say freedom over people's lives. Come on, one more time. Once I was broken. Once I was broken, but not anymore. Once I was broken, but not anymore. Once I was broken, but not anymore. Healed and forgiven. Whatever the past represents for you, Jesus Christ has a future that is greater, that is bigger, that is stronger, that is mightier than whatever the past represents in Jesus' Name. And you know those four things, those four things, what I believe, the power of the Spirit, what I say, which is declaring your future, what I see, which is living in freedom and what I do, which is overcome daily. They're not just for feel good things on a Sunday morning message. They're actually life convictions that I build into my life over time to face all of the challenges, the obstacles, the things that come from the past. I remind myself of the power of the Spirit. I remind myself to keep my confession in the Word of God, declaring my future. I remind myself I am free in Jesus Christ. I'm gonna live in that freedom. And I remind myself that overcoming is not a once off decision, but it's a daily decision in Jesus Christ that I can overcome. And let me tell you, you can overcome in Jesus' Name. So I pray you receive that this morning. And I wanna pray for one more group of people just while every head is bowed and every eye is closed. There's people here this morning that maybe you came with a family, maybe you came with a friend or a, or a neighbour, but can I say that you're not here by accident. You're not here by mistake. But friend, there is a God that loves you, that is calling you, that is drawing you to a life with Him. And friend, I wanna ask you, do you know His joy? Do you know His peace? Do you know His forgiveness? Because it only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And today, if you would open up your heart and say yes to Him, friend, God will come into your life. He'll give you a brand new start, a hope for your tomorrow. So if that's you this morning, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed and you're saying, yes, I need to connect my life to this Jesus, to this God, I wanna know Him. Then would you lift up your hand? Would you raise it up high enough and long enough so I can pray for you right now? That's it. Hands are being raised around this auditorium. People are saying yes to Jesus. There are others here and you know what? You once walked with God, but maybe in your heart you drifted. Maybe in your heart, you're away from God. Join those that are raising their hands and say, yeah, I'm coming back. Say, yeah, I'm making my peace with God. You lift it up as well if that's you. Fantastic. I'm gonna pray with all of these wonderful people with your hands raised. You can put your hands down. Let's say this prayer together. Dear Jesus, today I ask You to come into my heart, come into my life, forgive me of sin and all of my past mistakes. Today, Jesus, I choose You as my Lord, as my Saviour and as my best friend. Help me to live for You for the rest of my days. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen. Can we thank God for people responding? And if you did raise your hand, or even if you just said that prayer, but you meant it from your heart, well, we wanna make sure you get a Bible today. 
We want to make sure no one leaves without receiving this gift. It's a free gift from our church to you and it's the Bible. Let me tell you, the Bible, this book, it'll change your life if you, if you let it. You begin to read it, it'll begin to change your life. It's God's whole picture for your life the plan and the purpose that He has for you. And on your way out in every foyer, on every exit, there'll be people holding up these Bibles in the air. And uh, if you see someone holding them, just go up and say, hey, I prayed that prayer. We'll gladly give it to you. Put it into your hand because we think it's the best decision you can make with your life. Don't we, church? Amen. You received the Word this morning. Amen. Be blessed. Come on, everyone, everywhere. Really, thanks, Sanger, and um, and 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 Scott. We we want to say thank you, not just for a great word, but thank you for the way you've lived that and led as an example through that. Because this has helped this has helped a lot of people today. Amen. Would you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Outlast your past. I love it. I love it. Please, why don't you stay? I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to believe for the week that's ahead. But um, tonight. Tonight we're graduating all our night school students. We're really excited about that. And also we're gonna be praying for all our full-time students that got graduation. We have graduation tomorrow night for them, which should be pretty awesome. And, uh, and as well as that, as well as that, we've always got great praise, great worship, but I can't tell you how excited I am and uh, for what we're gonna be doing after the six o'clock service as it starts to get dark. So it's gonna be brilliant. And you know what? bring people, bring people. How many people that you know would have loved to hear a message like that, that they can outlast their past? So bring people tonight, it's gonna be brilliant. But I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna believe God for the week that's ahead. So Father, I thank You in Jesus' Name. Thank You for Your Word that was spoken. And I believe as we leave, Father, many people when they leave this room will be leaving behind, Father, so many things of their past that have tried to rob them. And so we leave with the freedom that You've given. Father, I thank You that Your grace and Your favour, Lord, go before Your people. Thank You that Your face shines upon them and that, Lord, You truly do have the last say in our lives. In Jesus' Name, Amen, Amen, Amen. Hey, God bless you, church. We'll see you tonight. Here I stand, I in surrender, I need you now. Oh my heart, now and forever, my soul cries out. Here I stand, here I stand, I in surrender, I need you